Buongiorno, eh, siamo qua per la conferenza stampa del nostro film in concorso A World to Come e prima di cominciare vi presento gli ospiti al tavolo partendo in fondo alla mia destra. Il, uno dei protagonisti è Chris Abbott. Vanessa Kirby, la regista del film Mona Fasfo, la protagonista, eh, co protagonista Catherine Watterson, il produttore del film Christine Vachon. Um, I'm going to start with a question and you raise your hand, alzate la mano se avete domande, che io comincio. Um, it's, just, it's just a question for, um, for Mona. Uh, Ron Hansen's and Jim Shepard's script was brought to you. What did you like about it and how did you make it yours? It's a mic. Oh, sorry. The silver. This one, yeah. I, um, I got the script from um, a wonderful producer, uh, with Collator, who brought it to me. And... Uh, I was immediately struck by how incredibly uh, beautiful the dialogue was. And, um, and I thought that, uh, and they were so open and collaborative uh, to, to really let me make it mine and move into the story. And, and uh, we had a very exciting um, a period of just working on the characters and the, and the structure. The, 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 their work is, is very rooted in, um, in historical detail. And I loved it when I, saw, when I saw the film. One of the things I loved the most was that um, it doesn't show um, Abigail and Tally's story through the prism of guilt, you know, through the lens of guilt and, 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 and shame, but it allows you to live it as a very joyful and, 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 and you know, as awkward as, as experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I think for, and for the actress, too, how liberating it was not to have to go through that process. I think that, that was something we talked a lot about when we were uh, working on these characters, to really, that this, the section of the story that is truly joyful for that to be a celebration. And, uh, and that was important to me. And that's something we talked about early on, I remember as well, when we were working on the, on the, on the script and also on the characters that, uh, there is something so um, wonderful about getting to see this kind of story and experience this kind of story um, in a really joyful and celebratory way. I suppose I would just add, there, there's very little known about working class homosexual stories. Um, we have some records of Um, journals found uh, from the upper classes and it seemed to me that Ron and Jim had this great access to the period and were able to fill in in a really honest way what could have been and most very likely was possible in, um, in rural places where You, you are just simply far too isolated to feel the pressures or the judgments of a community. And I think it's a really beautiful notion to consider that people could have and were most likely finding each other in these ways in the past. We, we don't have the record of it, but it's, it's, you know, it's a very beautiful notion, I think. Um, and... And who knows, maybe one day under a floorboard somewhere, somewhere we will find journal entries, you know, that tell stories like this. I think that the, um, I think that Jim, the, the seed of this story came from one line in a, a farm log. And the line in it was, uh, you know, it was all just sort of two chickens died, we need to fix the roof. And then there was just one line that said, um, My best friend has moved away. I do not believe I shall ever see her again. She probably moved like 20 or 30 miles away, but that was the time. And um, yeah, I just I always thought that was really striking. I just wanted to add that. Vanessa, do you want to add something to, to how liberating, if it, in, in any way, it was uh, to be able to have this thing as a kind of an unknown, live it, you know, like an unknown experience, so it's joyful and... and, and, and As in Tally, as a, as yeah. a character, yeah. It was, uh, it, was Tally, a, yes. it was such a gift to play someone that was, um, in her very nature, 
pushing against the restrictions that she had kind of placed upon her and someone actually that I felt reading it was extremely dynamic and I always imagined her in a different era, the things that she would have achieved and she talks a lot about that. And I think it made me, I, I didn't, it wasn't that long ago where these women didn't have a choice in what they did with their daytimes, you know, let alone who they might love. And uh, so it was a really beautiful thing to kind of live through these, these, these two women that kind of represent those women at the times, um, that just for a, for a brief moment in their lifetimes, they actually got intimacy and connection, and, and, which is something we all deserve. It made me very grateful for the choices I have in my life because of it. So in that way, it really changed, you know, uh, I felt more, yeah, more gratitude for what the things that I have. Um, both Abigail um, and, and Tally, but also that, that you know, it's another beauty of the film is like they don't verbalize their 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 feelings, and uh, so if uh, uh, Chris, please join in as well. If you can talk a little bit about the work with the actors to 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 create this sense of progressive intimacy and discovery uh, without having the benefit of, of expressing it by words, you know. So it's Mona's directing, and, and it's also just, the, just sort of the, the, the relationship you are created with each other, I presume, during the filming. For Chris, me? Yeah, for, for anyway. all of you. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, so I, I uh, you know, we, we had uh, this beautiful piece of text, and um, it is all sort of... Uh, there's so much, so much of the language is in codes, and that's how we spent our time, I think, the most in rehearsal, just trying to decipher these codes that, that what are we really trying to say to each other here, but we are not, we do not dare to say it out loud, or we cannot say it out loud. Uh, so I think, especially the, the you know, the, me, and, me and the cast, we were always, we have to step off and then... Say, what, say it in our, our real, uh, you know, how we would say it today, and then go back to the text again and kind of oscillate back and forth between that. Um, but, um, yeah, do, do you guys want to add anything to that? Just on, mm. just on that, within that, you have to decide, okay, am I speaking in code and being understood? Am I speaking in code and being misunderstood? Is she speaking in code? Do I understand it? Do I understand what she means, but I don't dare progress it? You know, there was so much. It was, the text was so incredibly rich. And sometimes we would rehearse a scene and feel this incredible sense of relief. Finally, a scene actually pretty straightforward. And then we would go to film it. And there was still, there was just something more to mine that we hadn't discovered, and it was kind of incredible, no, Vanessa? I mean, like, we, we, um, we were really duped a few times <laughs> by some scenes we thought, like, were quite clear and plain and yeah. were incredibly complex. So yeah. Every time we finished, Catherine would go, no, now I understand. <laughs> we have to do it again. <laughs> In that sense. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like Shakespeare, you know? Mm. It's just, you could make this movie forever and you'd find more things in the scenes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Chris, Vanessa, do you want to add something? Um, I think, well, there's something to the fact that uh, given the time period, the characters lived in isolation, and we also essentially shot very much in isolation. So I think there's an economy in which, uh, in how people spoke at the time. And um, so I think that was just very true, very true to the story and, and what it was. Also, we just got on so well, unusually well as a cast, I think. And that really helped because we were all also filming in a in a valley in like deepest Romania and so it was a very isolated um, valley and we were all together in a hotel and that kind of bonded us completely but also gave us such a sense because Mona decided to really build these houses they weren't sets they were fully built and spent months making them every detail which so you really felt the the space between and that's something we're not used to now like space is completely collapsed in our time everything's here if we need it straight away. And so that kind of um, time sort of stretches and can seem like forever, particularly if you're missing someone. Um, and so that, that feeling was kind of, we had to cultivate inside. And Catherine and I just got on so well. So that always helps because she's easy to love. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you too, baby. <laughs> 
No, I just was saying I love her too. <laughs> uh, um, there is a question here, but I want to just follow up quickly with a question to Christine, since you mentioned Romania, building a, a village from, from scratch. Uh, you know, I know it's about a 24-day shoot. So what are the, for producer, uh, you know, an American producer, what are the challenges to do a movie like this in Europe? Um, and with this as, uh, you know, formal ambition and with the means that are, uh, that you have. I mean, I think as, as was kind of evidenced, the challenges, the, the benefits far outweighed the challenges. I think, you know, it was a real act of trust and faith for everybody to take that trip, you know? Uh, it was really, you know, diving in, you know, head first, not really knowing, you know, what, what the experience would really be like, I think, for any of us. Um, but uh, it afforded us just, I think, a, a kind of texture and nuance to, to, uh, to the film itself that we wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. Redomanda per il Signore. Buongiorno, Peter Paul Hu, Televisione Tedesca, German Television. Um, I have basically two questions. One is, um, I felt there was a connection between um, the character Abigail's desire for knowledge, for uh, finding the atlas, uh, and also kind of knowing more about herself and finding out about the things she could not express. How, how did you see that? And another thing which I liked very much was how the intimate scenes were kind of given in this very late moment in a rapid uh, and not kind of being led to in a conventional way. This I liked a lot. Thank you. Mm. Um, Do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, yeah, for the, um, the intimate scene at the end is something I felt very strongly about from um, the, when I received the script and I, I wanted to have that scene. I wanted to place it there specifically um, because I thought how you know, I wanted every, I wanted you in a way to feel deprived of that moment and only to get it when it was too late and that that could be a moment of, you know, release and devastation and not be there to titillate you or something throughout the film. It's your idea, right? It wasn't yeah. in the original script. No. Tell them. Yeah. <laughs> so, no. So, so, I, so I wanted it to, because I think it's very hard to do love scenes and I think it's uh, hard to do love scenes between two women and uh, I wanted to find a way to do that in a really truthful way. And it was very important to all of us that we did that in a truthful way. So um, for me, the placement of that scene um, helps with that a lot. That makes sense. Mm. Mm. Yes. yes. Um, when I was sent this script, uh, I knew I needed to do it after the first line of um, voiceover, which actually didn't end up in the film, but was, um, at night I often wonder if those who have been my intimates have found me to be a steep hill whose view does not repay the ascent. And I don't know, it gives me chills. I don't know why I find it so moving, but this person who is, is longing she, she, uh, she is wide awake to her realities. Her life will not extend beyond the acres of this farm. It will not. She will have children. They may live. They may not. She uh, will labor endlessly and then one day die herself. And this is. This is what she knows. This is the limit of her life. And uh, what she longs for is to be someone that not just has the knowledge, but can have it and give it, can be in an exchange in the world. You know, because the real pleasure of knowledge isn't really, I mean, I suppose for some, isn't really about just being able to strut your stuff and spew your facts. It's about being able to share and connect with people. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so 
you know, these two women are life rafts for one another. It's not just love at first sight, it's life at first sight, right? It's like, this is it. This is what I'm gonna get. And it's extraordinary, but it's also it, which probably makes it all the more extraordinary, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not, it's not like the lives we get to have today where hopefully we'll have interesting careers and also profound friendships and also great loves. I mean, we don't all get it all, right? But, you know, it's a possibility. <laughs> um, and she knows. It was a very bizarre thing, that exploration someone who knows their fate. Sono Gloria Satta del Messaggero, faccio una domanda a Vanessa Kirby. Ecco, lei è qui con due film in concorso che sono passati uno dietro l'altro. Ci sono secondo lei dei punti di contatto fra il ruolo in cui l'abbiamo vista ieri e il ruolo che ha interpretato oggi? E pensa che finalmente il cinema si è deciso, come risulta da questa mostra eccezionalmente eh, ricca di film eh, di donne con le donne, se il cinema si è finalmente accorto delle, della necessità di dare dei ruoli di spessori alle attrici. Grazie. The first part, uh, Vanessa, was if you, if you, have a, the, you see a connection between the character you played in this film and the one in you played in uh, Pieces of a Woman. And the second part was if you think that the um, uh, finally uh, cinema is, 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 is ready to give women the role they deserve, uh, you know, in, 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 in films. So what was the comparison? Yeah. Yeah, the first was a comparison, yeah. Um, yeah, it was actually such a gift for me. Um, those those six months of shooting the two films because we literally did them concurrent like back to back and we shared an editor and a make hair and makeup design in common mm -hmm. and me and Cornell and Mona and are great friends so it, it and it was kind of strange because you know I, it was so wonderful to to support a story where one woman was experiencing grief of loss of a child and then pl go and play one and so it was wonderful to be around Catherine exploring that uh, her, her story in that sense. Um, and yeah, they felt like sister companions somehow. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's amazing that they're both here. I'm so grateful. And I'm also, I, it, they made me even more passionately sort of have faith in that there are so many untold female stories. I mean, I, I felt privileged that I was telling a story of a of an, an unborn baby that um, perhaps hasn't been represented in this particular way on screen before, and also mm -hmm. the stories of these kind of unknown women. And I think Tali and Abigail represent the unknown woman of these times that are lost in history and perhaps had ordinary but lives with extraordinary moments, you know, like as Catherine said, that mm -hmm. we strive for all the time in our, in our society. And I think I love the title, The World to Come, because I feel like there's a legacy of women that have, have lived those kind of lives so that we can live ours now as women. And I feel like as we choose to represent things collectively, you know, we're all here at a festival celebrating art that, and supporting female directors and female characters who tell those stories that haven't been told before. And I feel that's a great responsibility because I want women growing up to, to sit in cinemas and watch stories that they can relate to or feel have comfort in or feel differently about themselves and identify parts of themselves in and if this movie helps us uh, appreciate where our kind of you know our our gender and the history of our gender and the things that they did so that we could we could have many things that we do now i.e responsibility of telling their stories i uh i feel that's like a profound duty of ours um, a question there Hello, hi, sorry. Oh. Um, hi, Scott Roxborough from uh, The Hollywood Reporter. Um, also, uh, Vanessa Kirby, actually, just following up on that question, uh, because you were talking before about choices, and it seems with both these films, uh, you've made uh, quite a bit of departure from some of the roles we've seen you play on cinema before, maybe closer to some of the theater work that you've done. Um, what you were just talking about, responsibility as well. Um, are these the kind of roles um, playing more complex, uh, in some cases, much more darker uh, figures? Uh, the direction you want to go uh, going forward? Um, definitely, and thank you for saying that. Um, I, you know, I, 
I was so privileged to play Ibsen and Chekhov and Tennessee Williams and Shakespeare, and I feel like there's such a, there are many great female roles on stage, and um, I feel like there's now more space than ever in cinema to try and, um, yeah, make make way for those performances. Catherine does one in the world to come. It was an honor to watch her do that. Um, and I also, my, my, my great inspirations are Gina Rowlands and Jessica Lange and, you know, th those women from that era. And they gave such a set of, you know, a trajectory of incredible, different, complicated, often dark performances. Um, and it, you know, it, they were always been my inspiration. So for, for you to say that is uh, very kind. And I, I, I would hope, you know, I would hope to try and uh, continue doing performances that um, are scary to approach and hopefully change um, mm, representation in the industry somehow of, of, of us. Mm -hmm. There is a, a question there, sorry, I kept intruding with my finger. Buonasera, sono Roberto Sapienza di Parola Colori. Volevo fare una domanda alla regista. Io non ho letto il racconto, però ho avuto la sensazione che una storia di due donne di solitudine, anche i ruoli maschili, siano un po' diversi, nel senso che il marito di Abigail sia più accogliente e capisca forse l'esigenza della moglie di avere qualcosa di diverso, mentre il marito di Tagli è più duro. Mi chiedevo se queste sfumature sono presenti nel racconto o lei le ha plasmate e se quindi con gli attori ha lavorato in questo senso per vedere questa sottile differenza nei due ruoli maschili. Grazie. Mm. Yes, I, it was already there in um, not so much in the short story but very much but in the script it was already there and then I wanted to enhance it further and make um, I wanted, you know, there was potential, and also with, with you know, with, with Casey um, playing uh, playing Dyer as well. He has this unique, you know, he's this vulnerability that he brings to all of his performances that I thought was beautiful to have that in Dyer. That he is also not quite, he doesn't quite fit in the position that he is given because of you know the times they lived in, and he's trying to to understand and trying to support his partner, even though it's difficult for him. Uh, that would also make, you know, uh, Abigail, uh, Catherine's, uh, Catherine plays her, her journey also more complicated, which is therefore more interesting. And in terms of um, uh, Finney that Chris, uh, Chris Abbott plays, I, you know, I, I wanted him, we wanted, we talked about adding, a, you know, charm and, and a sense of humor and just making also that more, you know, making him in that way also feel more, more dangerous in a way and, and, and that there's a sense of mystery to that relationship that we also don't quite, we don't know exactly what's happening there because Abigail doesn't either. So yeah, we do talk about like how can we find all these you don't want to make anyone too archetypical or, or you know, uh, straight cut in that way. I wanted it to be um, complex and complicated because, yeah, then uh, we have more, more to look at. I also just want to add to that, actually. It, it, I, don't, I don't know if you agree, Catherine. It felt so amazing to be supported by these incredible actors as them being fem female stories by Chris, Casey, and Shia. It was really... Um, did you feel that too? felt, uh, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Yeah, felt very lucky. I remember also one thing that really struck me again on the first page of the script was that it, um, Abigail is described as an asset to Dyer. Mm -hmm. Very interesting notion. It has positive and negative connotations. Uh, the presence of need in this film is, is quite palpable, you know. When he says to her later in the film, I would die without you, what does it mean? Does, is, is, is he speaking literally or is he expressing his love? It could be either. Um, uh, and I think Casey, uh, what we developed together, I was, I was so pleased with his ability to recognize that nuance and um, and it was really fun to play with it. You know, um, how, how much are we in a contract, a, an economic agreement? How much 
um, have we been brought closer because of this economic arrangement and what kind of love do we have? I thought it was, I thought it was just, I mean, it's just such an impressive script, but that's just one of the many things that I found uh, incredibly sophisticated about it, just that exploration. Um, because there isn't, there isn't a single kind of bond or a, or a right kind of relationship, you know. There, there, there's a lot to it that I think was very meaningful and important, although it may have not been a great love, you know. I, I completely agree that the, that the male characters are written uh, with much more nuances that, you know, you could, you could have gotten away without having any depth. And, and Chris, please, can you, and there is a lot of mystery in the relationship between Tally and, 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 and your character. And can you tell us a little bit the way you were thinking of that, of that relationship? Um, well, I mean, I'll just say first, it's been a, it's a dream of mine for years to play a um, turn of the century mentally ill farmer. And I finally <laughs> got the chance. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the relationship um, between Finney and Tally is very complicated because I think, weirdly, and going off of what, you know, Mona and Catherine and Vanessa were saying before, that there's always some sort of undertone that's not being said. There's always something that's not being said. And I think that there is a lot that's not being talked about or said between um, Tally and Finney. And strangely, even though you might not see it, I think there is some odd love there. Um, and I think, I just think that the character of Finney doesn't, <laughs> has no idea how to express it. Um, so it, it, it'll come out in some, you know, foul behavior. Um, but nonetheless, still makes it interesting to explore. Um, we're running out of time, but I have a very quick question for Mona, which is actually a long quest, uh, you know, a long answer. But uh, the, the, some, we haven't mentioned the beauty, the visual beauty of the of the film, and it's really a testament of, of, of your, you know, your aesthetic idea, your your sense of style, you know. And can you just, from the choice of shooting 16 millimeter uh, to the photography, just quickly give us a sense of what you were thinking, because it's really it's really a beautiful uh, piece. Thank you so much um, for that. Yes, I, uh, I love 16 millimeter. Uh, I think it's such a beautiful format. And uh, the main inspiration for the movie were a lot of paintings of, of, the, of the time period because I also wanted to, you know, you, you, I wanted to look at images, also images created by women um, as well, and, and to sort of look, approach it with a different sense of aesthetic, which I think to some people were, uh, very, they were not used to seeing the past portrayed in this specific way. Um, so, and I had, and then I had wonderful, you know, my wonderful production designer, Jamal Sampusos, and uh, DP Andre Shemitov, who we worked closely together in, in trying to create this sort of this painter-like uh, universe um, that still had all the grit and the dirt and the texture uh, that I felt that the the period deserved. And then I, you know, we, I, I, I love, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to be a filmmaker is because I, I love cinema, I love film so much. So uh, it's exciting to see, you know, with the limitations we have today with shooting, with very tough schedules, I still think it's so exciting to see how can we push uh, the, the image further? How can, how can we create um, a shot that is exciting? That is, how can we explore the format in that way, even with that? 24 days and with very difficult text. So my wonderful cast and crew, you know, just pushed so hard to, to, to come with me on that journey to try and achieve that as well. And unfortunately, I've been told twice that we run out of time, so we have to finish here. I want to thank everyone for, on this panel for being here, for having brought us the film, and uh, thank you for, for coming to the press conference. Uh,